Thank you so much for being here today, everybody, on the screens and in the room. Um, we have the pleasure to have the joint WCCH and heart function transplant rounds with the ATI seminar today. I'd like to start with uh, the land acknowledgments. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we're located on at Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, and the Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. We also would like to thank Paladin for their support of the ATI seminar series. Um, and it's my great pleasure today. I'm sorry, we have a little bit of technical issues in this room here, so that's why we're using a laptop, so it may look a little bit funny in terms of presentation. Um, but I understand you can already see the slides. So we'll have Dr. Thomas Möller presenting here today. Dr. Möller is the head or if I understand correctly, basically the only pediatric heart <laughs> transplant person in um, uh, Oslo University Hospital in Norway, where he's been on staff since 2011. After having had some training in Canada, including Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children uh, and other places. And he shares his clinical time with uh, research activity and um, has some active research projects around failing Fontan circulation or Fontan circulation and new therapeutic options for that. And he will present to us today about the challenges, I guess, and creative solutions of a country that has similar temperatures as ours and similar low population density, but is situated in a very different, I guess, uh, political environment. So Thomas, please. Thanks a lot, all of you. Hello, it's a great honor and pleasure to, um, to be able to um, give this little talk about our Nordic and uh, Norwegian experiences. And when Simon asked me, I was a bit shocked that I would give a talk here. We are coming here to learn from you, like the masters. And then I was supposed to, to tell you something about us. So, uh, so in the beginning, I was really unsure what to what to tell you about. And I, I realized that there are maybe important differences in the environment we are working in. And, uh, and we, of course, are, is our smaller center working differently. So I think maybe I have something to tell you after all. We'll see. And I'm here, actually, one of our... Our younger colleagues, Aslaki, is a fellow here in, in Alberta for this year. So another task of this visit was to visit him and his family, of course, see how he is doing. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to get him back to Norway with, all, with everything he's learned and with his training. So we were three people coming here. Okay, page two. Use the arrow bars. Yeah, try this mouse here. Okay. Just click on the screen. Then you can see the mouse there, and you can see the mouse there as well. On the large. Yeah. So I have to go to the left something. Yeah. Or just up. Yeah, there you are. Up. Okay. So I have no disclosures for this presentation. And this is the outline of the talk. I will tell you a bit about. Norway and the North or the Nordic countries or Scandinavia or what, whatever uh, you want to choose for the region. Uh, I will give you some numbers for our transplant activities in the region. And then I will try to, uh, to give you an idea of the characteristics and challenges and differences to your environment and the cultural medical world here in Canada and North America. So Norway is um, a country far north from Alberta. I learned that Edmonton is on on the same uh, latitude as uh, or altitude as Hamburg. So we are completely north of it, but because of the Gulf Stream, it's, it's warmer climate than here. We have not that that cold winters that you have here. Um, and uh, the area actually, I had to look it up. It's smaller than Alberta, like two thirds of it. Uh, even included Spitsbergen and Jan Mayen uh, and the Barents Sea. 
and we have five uh, five point four million people. About us, three point seven. So the, it's we are actually we almost never say this, but we are more densely populated than you. <laughs> <laughs> so in our country is uh, actually we are outside the EU. We are in a in a kind of uh, a con uh, organization outside the EU, with a very few countries connected to the EU economically, but not in the polit political union. Maybe we will never be. Who knows? Uh, the Red Star is our our capital, Oslo. Uh, the like health-wise, the Norway is divided into four health administrative regions. And the southeast Norway region around the Oslo Fjord, more or less, is 50% uh, of the population. So it's not equally distributed. And our hospital, the Oslo, Oslo University Hospital, and especially, especially our part is the hospital. It's it's one part of the Oslo University Hospital. It's the main hospital for the region, but also a national hospital for many functions we have. So we are the only transplant center in Norway at all. It sounds yeah, strange, but it's, it has many advantages actually to keep it in one house, in one hospital. It's, it's always been like this and it was very wise to do it actually. So this is our hospital where we are working, Aslak is working and, and our team is working in part of the Oslo University Hospital, Elix Hospitale. Our center for the last um, 20 years, it has been the only surgical center for pediatric uh, heart surgery and congenital heart surgery. We have four surgeons, differs a bit, sometimes three, sometimes four. Uh, and we have 200 pediatric and 50 uh, adult congenital operations per year. Uh, we are the only center for invasive pediatric cardiology. So we have three, um, Intensivists, no, not intensivists, uh, interventional cardiologists in our stuff, and only 10 cardiologists, which is even in the Nordic um, environment, few people. When we compare to our other Nordic centers and this of the same size, uh, we, we realize they have the double, they have like 20, 23 or something staff cardiologists. So we are, uh, we are running faster than all the others. Uh, we have 230 procedures a year, uh, CATH procedures, 60% of them interventional. And we have electrophysiology, genetic cardiology, and all the services you need, and transplant, of course, but no VAT center. I will tell you more about it. Is the sound okay? And I'm talking loud enough? Seems yes. Okay. So what would you know about Norway? Some people say Norway, isn't that the capital of Sweden? No, it is not. It's a, it's a, different, it's a different country. I have heard that actually yeah. on, on the internet. Uh, no, it's not. It's a, it's a separate country. We were under Sweden and under Denmark for, for centuries, I think. I don't know the history because I didn't learn it in school. I'm a German immigrant. So, uh, but what would you know? So you're maybe one of the two or three countries in the world, I wouldn't show fjords and uh, our landscape because you have spectacular nature as well. But maybe you know our brown cheese, a goat cheese. You might know that we are oil nation like you are, I think. Uh, so we had the same crisis in 2008, like you had, and we, we, are, we, are in this, we are sharing fate, like being dependent on the fossil world. And uh, of course, to the left, you you might recognize a guy Jens Stoltenberg, a prime former prime minister, and he is a very present person in the in the media today as a secretary general of NATO, which he has prolonged several times, I think. Uh, and uh, maybe you recognize the singer as well. It's one of the most famous singers uh, of all times, Kirsten Flagstaff. She was a soprano in New York in the 40s, um, very famous. And maybe you even recognize the couple. It's Maybrit and Edward Moser. We are very proud of them. They are like Nobel Prize winners in medicine and physiology a few years ago with her brain research uh, of uh, orientation. Actually, those two, I can tell that they were in the, in, when they were students, they were friends with my wife. She's Norwegian, so in our kitchen we have a wooden a wooden Christmas card by my bird and Edward Moser. Actually, <laughs> oh. so they are famous and they are quite uh, good researchers. They're driving a uh, a large lab, and of course Edward Greek, you know. So these are some of the Norwegians stars. Where's Aha? 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. You, you think they should be there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of um, and then another thing I I um, came to think of the cyclosporin story. That's uh, closely connected to Norway as well. And you know you know all about the cyclosporin. And when I looked up for this talk, I realized this is a long story actually. How how it uh, was discovered, and there are three mighty guys um, fighting about who actually discovered the cyclosporin, and they are not not agreeing on it. Who was the pioneer? So that was at that time, Sandoz, the the pharmaceutical company, asked their employees to uh, sample uh, earth or, or soy couples, soy samples, on the vacation. And uh, there was one sample from Norway, from the Hadangavida, which is the, the middle part of the southern part of Norway. It's one of the largest um, uh, untouched nature parks in Europe, actually. And I think it took quite some time before they analyzed it in search for new microbiotic agents. And a few, and, and there was, they found some antifungal activity of cyclosporin A and C. And but I don't think they they proceeded with it, and and um, immunosuppressants weren't very attractive at the time. It was the time of the moratorium in the in the transplant world, and it didn't work out in the sixties. But in nineteen seventy six, uh, there were the first human trials in with cyclosporin. So other things to know about Norway and and cardiology. So this is the southern part of Norway and Sweden. It's cardiac ultrasound. We are really. I would say strong nation, strong environment in the cardiac ultrasound. Uh, maybe the older ones have heard about this woman, Liv Hutler. She was one of the big pioneers in cardiac ultrasound in the 70s and the early 80s, starting with the AMOD ultrasound with the early machines, and she was from Trondheim. Uh, we have an environment for ultrasound research in Oslo, in our hospital, in the, in the adult part of the hospital with Otto Smithet and diastolic dysfunction and echo techniques of diastolic diagnostics. And actually, uh, 20 kilometers from where I live on the outer part of the Oslo Fjord, we have the GE company. There's the developing center for their high-end machines, actually, in Horten, in Norway. It's a technology hotspot. Uh, so there's something about Norway and cardiology. So, and then the broadest perspective, uh, the Nordic countries and the terms. So we have Scandinavia. Actually, Scandinavia is, is, uh, is uh, this peninsula. Uh, if you're very strict, it's Norway and Sweden. It's the Scandinavian peninsula, but Scandinavia is Denmark as well. Uh, and when you go take Finland and Iceland, we are talking about the Nordic countries or the North. Um, and actually, after the Iron Curtain has fallen, there, there has been another concept, which is Baltic Scandia, uh, to take the, the Baltic region within the Nordic region. And they have they have this um, uh, understanding of themselves as part of the Nordic world. We don't realize it really, I think in Scandinavia, but they are. It's, it's a cultural. Uh, entity. So um, in Europe, one of these big differences when we are talking heart transplant or transplant at all, uh, that we are very split up. Uh, so we are like 350 million people or so in Europe. And we have, I think it's 13 uh, organ exchange organizations, and they have to cooperate. So we are the blues, we are the blues on top, uh, Scandia transplant, actually now with Estonia as well as part of it. And we have to cooperate like very most often with Eurotransplant, which are many people, 135 uh, million uh, with the UK. I don't think it's very often that we get organs from France, Switzerland or Hungary, maybe Poland. And, and this all has to be uh, like regulated in a way. So the, the agencies, they have their regulations and rules. And then they have the regulations in between, between countries and between agencies. Uh, and it's quite complicated. I'm happy that I'm not involved in these organ ex exchange things. We have our transplant coordinators. Uh, it's not, it's a different role than here. That, so they are just on the phone and, and really coordinate an organ exchange between these organizations. And that's probably easy here because you have 
you have the Canadian one and then some exchange with one other organization. So it must be easier. Uh, but it has worked uh, in a way for us. We are still talking about um, uh, ischemic time and the, being concerned where we get a heart from Germany as I might be two or three hours, or maybe even four. I know this is not an issue for you. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's something to bring back home. Actually, we, we shouldn't be too concerned about that. And we should be more active probably in exchanging baby homes or something, which everybody has to feel. Three hours away is a lot for donor bars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will cite you on that. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So, and our, our own region in, the, in Scandinavia and Estonia, we have Scandia transplant. So we are covering 28 or 29 million people. Uh, and we are, we, are, we are not tiny. So we are, we are uh, very similar countries, similar medical culture and me medical tradition. And, and we have full coverage or full oversight over our patients and the population. Everyone has a personal number. And we, we know where everybody lives and which healthcare they have had. And so, and, and you would think we would be very strong um, uh, people in like publishing uh, population based data and think. And we always know that we, are, we would be very strong in, in science, in population based science. But we are struggling to, to pull our things together actually to, to exchange data. So together in the in the pediatric or in the trans heart transplant world, we are six centers doing heart transplant in this region. We have 150 to 200 transplants a year in total, and approximately 15 to 20 pediatric heart transplants a year. And what I said, from the outside, we are looking like very homogeneous. It's from a from a book about Norway. And so, but from the outside, we we look very similar. But when you live there from the inside, you you get you realize more and more how different actually the, Scan the Scandinavian countries are. Like on the left is the Bon Vivant, the, the Danish people in a in a design chair, smoking and drinking. <laughs> and so, in the middle would be very orderly, uh, very rule obeying Swede, and on the right side the nature loving Norwegian with the dog and the mountains and almost never being inside or so. So that's that's our our concept of being Scandinavian. That's, that's Canada too. <laughs> yeah, Eastern the West. different roles. Yeah. <laughs> so, and these are our centers. You see, we are more or less the, the fourth, um, the five centers in the pediatric uh, transplant world. We are, we are more or less the same because Sweden is all, always double of the other countries, but they have two centers. So that's why we are quite similar, all the centers. And together we have uh, we have like 15 to 20 transplants a year or so. And it was, wasn't before 2019, actually, when we tried to, uh, to group together the pediatric heart transplant people. We have to, to be a group. We have to meet each other regularly. We, we hadn't, hadn't had that before. And then we re realized that we actually had some differences in between us. So sweet, you see here from the number, this, these are one decade of transplant, 2009 to 2018. And the Swedish numbers are the double of the other centers. And the main difference is actually the, the infant transplant. So Finland and Sweden, they have, they're following the international standard of care, I would say. And Denmark and Norway hadn't. Excellent. We had one in the 90s sometimes an infant transplant before one year of age, and the Danish hadn't at all. And this, this is this kind of attitude and philosophy I'm still not um, convinced if I understand uh, this concept of not, not saving lives if they are very young. Uh, it would be better in doing comfort care and, and, and not willing, be willing to invest uh, like a bad program or something to save those lives. But for sure, we had to do something about it. And at that time already, we were um, changing our listing practice towards listing also the infants, even if we had no real donor uh, donor heart for them. I would come to that. Um, so we, we knew we had to do something. We had to be similar, at least in the Scandinavian area. There's no reason for us to be that different. 
for hard transplant in general, you have this uh, GODT, this oversight uh, database. So the, these are the four countries where we are located in hard transplant, all ages per, per, popula per population. It's like the Swedish on top, uh, Finland, uh, Denmark, and Norway. We are, we are close together. Canada is here. So we are not that different from you in, in total numbers of heart transplant for per population. Uh, and even if on the maps as well, we are we're quite similar actually, even if we are if our practice is different, how we are organized and so on. But the numbers in total are the same. So heart transplant in Norway started in 1983 already. And the first uh, Nordic heart transplant was done in, in Oslo, actually, which they are very proud of. And it's not the uh, the lady died actually a year ago or two years ago also. So she really survived it. She was a, an adolescent when she was transplanted. Uh, and now we are in, in a European environment. We are one of the larger centers actually doing 30 to 40 transplants a year. Uh, three to five pediatric heart transplants, uh, very variable before 18 years of age. And uh, per, as per March this year, I think we have done around a thousand, or we crossed the thousand border uh, some months ago for heart transplants, uh, and 800 of them should be alive. And these are our numbers from our center. So we have done it quite a while, but it, you see it like 10 years ago, 2010, or so we, 2008, we had an audit in our department um, with Philip Saul from South Carolina, actually, from outside, and we one of the, the comments we got that we, we should transplant more. Our transplant numbers were too low on average. So we have restructured our, our <coughs> program less oriented towards adult transplant and more to the, to the international pediatric transplant world. And our numbers are where they should be right now, I think, per population. It was an increase uh, on average. Uh, and we have done like 88 since the start in 86. And for the last decade, we had on average 3.8 a year, but from one to eight to nine. And, and you see, this, this, is, this is the age distribution. We are preferably transplanting school children and teenagers, and we have had no, no long standing tradition for doing infants or small children. And uh, we have changed that actually the last years. Uh, with good help from you and from Anne Dipshant. And so we started our own ABO incompatible program, got the protocols and did the first one two, two years ago, I think, without, I was on the phone with you, I think, at night. <laughs> Should we do, because we, we weren't ready to do the, the um, uh, antibody extraction at that time. And the boy had almost no antibodies and we were a bit afraid the first time doing it and we just did it. And, it went well, heart-wise. Everyone's a comp always afraid the first time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. everybody was afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Just, the perfusionist and surgeon, everyone was sitting around when you were talking on the phone. So. And it went well, actually. So, and now we have the program with this loom system to by extracting or filtrating out the antibodies. We don't, we won't do an exchange if we need to. And these are our numbers. So for the last 10 years, we have increased. Before that, we always had like 10 or 11 children in Norway. And now I think we are stable at the, between 25 and 30 children at all. I think that that's where we will stay. And uh, more and more of them are, are followed at other centers apart from the yearly checkup. And we had to work on that as well. So we have 20, we have 20 um, pediatric services in Norway for this five and a half million. And um, some of them are really small, but we have a few centers who have had some experience now with our transplanted. Uh, children and it's working really well it's very like like you are that's nothing new to you uh, like checklist based and we have our protocols online they can look up how they should do things they call me all the time uh, and that's working well and Cecilia as well she is our only transplant nurse and our transplant coordinator in, in Norway and we are happy to have mobile phones Actually, we just hired her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's you're very familiar with it. when you're like low density population and very few people experience in very high end medicine. It's like that. It's a lifestyle almost. So, and we have still all the all the children get the yearly checkup 
on admission and as we are still we are doing too too many biopsies we are about to change that actually <laughs> that's an, um so when asla comes like uh, that's uh, the latest we would do a change for now we're doing like a six to seven biopsies the first year uh, and that's that's actually similar in the, the whole in all the other centers in Scandia transplant, we are doing all the same numbers, the same following the same rules, but we all want to come down. Nobody starts, so maybe we will be the first to to go down on the biopsy numbers. And we do the cath uh, every year, coroners not every year, uh, consults at that time, uh, GFR and so on. What do you what do you do? The same thing. Uh, our numbers are too small actually to to have extensive research uh, on the heart transplant just in our program and our cooperation with the other centers is too new to be to have established like research cooperation so our our heart transplant research is mainly based on the adult world we have a very active environment doing high intensity of training research uh, i think mike is uh, i think one of Somebody who was thinking about this is working on that as well, like early, early high intensity interval training for the transplant patients. Uh, they have had a large study uh, with early introduction of Everolimus mm -hmm. after transplant, like a few weeks. Uh, we have actually, and that's a cooperation with the pediatric and adult world, the uh, uh, auto autonomous re innovation study uh, on a tilt table and physiological studies of. Um, Parasympathic and sympathetic re-innovation. And I think they are working on an upcoming trial on the SGLT2 antagonist, isn't it? And, and the transplanted patients in adults. And on the pediatric side, we are working together with our colleagues from nephrology and, and hepatology. Hepatology, we don't have a lung program for pediatric lung transplant in Norway, actually. I don't think the others have in Scandinavia. So we have very reluctant to take them on. I think they are sent to the UK, the few cases. And we have just started um, a registry for PTLE to, to do that in the, in the common pediatric solid, solid organ transplant uh, environment in Norway. And it, I think two years ago, I, um, uh, I made up our numbers if we actually are good enough in our um, long-term results, if we can compare to others and to the ice HRT numbers. And uh, that gave me some comfort, actually. It's not, it, it looks better, but I think we are just the same, like the, the general numbers from the ice HRT. So these are the numbers from 86 to 2020, 84 cases and median survival for all of them were 24.7 years. And, uh, well, it looks better than the ISHLT number, I see in point five, but at least we are as good, I think. We are not worse. And uh, I also compare the early ones from the 80s and 90s, uh, where we have the 50% the 30, uh, the survival. Of course, it was like 16.2 years, very similar to the ISHLT 14.6 at a comparable era. And the new ones, of course, we don't have the 50%. They're still living. Um, and the same difference, actually, be between the congenital heart disease and the cardio cardiomyopathies, as you would expect. So the, it's not to be better, but it was just <clears throat> good to see that we are as good. We are where we should be, in, like quality-wise. So now to the characteristics and challenges in our environment. Um, you have heard this from me the last few days. We don't have a VAR program in Norway. It's a big headache for me. It has been for quite some years. We have the other centers like Helsinki, Lund in Sweden, Göteborg, Gothenburg, you say, in Sweden, and Copenhagen. And uh, we haven't, actually. And there are many reasons for it. It's it's difficult to tell that in a in a talk. It's it's a institutional resistance and uh, towards the old uh, stroke rates, uh, towards finances, uh, blockading uh, intensive care beds, anticipated blockage of it, because we have no experience. I can tell them that these kids are on the board and they are not like eleven months on the intensive care unit, but nobody has worked with it. Actually, other places who 
I think we have an ongoing discussion about it. We have had for eight, nine years or so, uh, but we haven't. Um, we have actually a large VAT program on the adult side in Norway, which had to change like anybody else from hardware to hard mate. And they, they are quite experienced. I don't know exactly the numbers, but in an European environment, they are uh, middle size or large. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, we have really um, not the interest for starting the VAT program. We are getting there. I think we are moving slowly towards something, but I'm still working on it. And I, I need some input and some, some advice from here. So I talked to Holger and to, of course, to Jennifer, how to start and how to, to move ahead and where to start and with what and education and which people to start with and, and so on. So we are getting somewhere, but it takes time. And of course, all the small Nordic centers, we are very dependent of networking and have, have strong friends like you and other big centers to send our younger colleagues to for education and training. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are completely dependent on. So we have a long-standing cooperation with Toronto. We have had fellows there for several fellows for ECHO and electrophysiology. I myself have done uh, ACHD fellowship at Toronto General. We have had Jacob, who was here the first three days. He, he has been to Melbourne to, to learn intensive care, cardiac intensive mm -hmm. care. We have had people going to London and now to Edmond. So we are very happy to expanding our network and our network of friends and partners. <laughs> so the other big thing, mostly for us, it's, it's um, it's the staffing. You are you have just incredibly many people working in this environment. Uh, it's like a, it's like a dream for us to go around because uh, yeah, standing with nineteen people or so in the intensive care unit uh, on rounds for uh, and everybody's listening listening to everybody and they all know their stuff and and uh, you put in an order for a stat echo and somebody will run and. Uh, and get an echo machine. So in Europe, I will run and get the echo machine. <laughs> so it's it's a completely different set to work with. And um, uh, yeah, and it's it it has to do with costs, of course, in the in the Nordic countries and in Europe and more in Northern Europe, people um, have higher income, higher wages. It's more equal. It's not the differences in high and low income. So every person you hire is, is a factor in hospital costs. You can't afford to have that many people. And it's all governmental uh, finance. And uh, so this is the, the cost thing and organized, organizational thing. But I think there's also a cultural thing in the Nordic countries. And you have correct me, like, because I'm the immigrant. There's, there's this thing about not, be, not being another person's assistant. That is wouldn't be good enough or something. So, so we struggle sometimes that as a doctors, we are taking in more and more functions and we are writing all our stuff ourselves and, and, and putting in orders and everything. It's just adding up and adding up because nobody wants to be our assistant anymore. And that, so that's the cultural side of it as well. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same in all European countries. Maybe you know. It's a, it's a cultural thing as well. Uh, that people don't um, thrive in the role to um, experience themselves as assistants of others. I'm not sure. As you know, the physicians are paid so little that they're the cheapest laborers. Yeah. So, yeah. so they make all the secretary work being done by the physicians. Yeah. Yeah. So they're just living their after hours. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to be like provocative, but there's something you, you must, it must be possible to explain this difference in staffing in the hospitals. And the, the difference in, in organizing work and work distribution. I'm not sure. I'm still thinking about it, what it how to explain it. Um, yeah, that's what I told you. Being other people's assistant. And there's another um, uh, so people here in North America are more mobile. You get a new job, you just move like a thousand kilometers or so. It's not the same in Europe. I don't think and uh, that's true, I think, for the whole of Europe. People want to have their life, work, and their career, and so where they live, where they want to live, and they have to adjust. And the hospital has to, has to adjust. Like we have these people, 
we can't find we can't pay another another person like a surgeon or so just uh, triple the uh, the wages and we will find a surgeon that's not possible in these countries uh, because you have to stick to the to the limits of of income and so on. maybe it's in some more southern europe it's possible just to pay more and you will find a surgeon to come uh, it's impossible so you really have to think 10 years ahead whom you want to be a surgeon in 10 years or so and to send them somewhere and hope they will not uh, start to fight with the other surgeons and so on it's a, it's a it's a different setting people are not that mobile that makes the difference in staffing as well and how to plan for stuff and we're talking like stuff and who could be this in five years from now or so who could be our nurse our vet coordinator so we are discussing it now so because we can't just buy them in sweden or in germany or something we can't afford so and then the other thing i talked to jennifer about or we had a chat about this it's data security like we are when you are having your rounds and conferences and so we have a meeting like regular every week you just email out a list of all the patients uh with all the stuff and the uncles and nephews and the feeding and the meds and so on a list and i would go to jail for that and uh, i'm sure in Norway. it's so tough the data protection actually uh cecilia as our our transfer nurse she's not always able to access the patient files they're not open to her so and when when I do research, like clinical research with a group, with study nurses, and so I have to give them access to the patient files as a group, and even then it doesn't work all the time. Uh, and it's it's logged, and the logs are checked who is accessing patient files and why and when, and people got fired for that. So GDPR actually is a tough thing, or the data security setting. Uh, I think the world would thank Europe, after all, for for being more strict to the social media companies and all that to be to pay the taxes where where they earn the money, and to be more uh, restrictive in um, in uh, spreading out people's information or information about people. I think it's a good thing. It's not it's not only bad, uh, but hospital wise and and for our working environment, sometimes it's just crazy. How we work and so that's and i told that to jennifer she didn't know have you have you noticed that all the european partners or, or friends and professionals you meet they have their gmail they're giving you your gmail their gmail address it's because you can't access your hospital email from the phone also i can't i can do it at night from the hotel with a 10 minute login or so so yeah that's the reason data security the same thing so it's pros and cons, but it's different. And uh, yeah, I remember it from from my time at SickKids as well. You just can mail around, and you can look up the list and be prepared for a meeting, for a transfer meeting, heart failure meeting, or single ventricular meeting, or so. It's hard to do that in our place, sitting at home. And maybe it's it's good for you to know that uh, people are working in a different environment. So. So. Then we have the organ donation question. That's another challenge or difference characteristic. Uh, in Norway, we have a high degree of public trust in our transplant business and transplant activities. Uh, we have a fair but not very high consent rate uh, from families for, for potential donors. And we haven't had any transplant scandals so far. We talked about it yesterday. Um, and we have had a quite late and, and uh, cautious introduction of the DCD program as a pilot. And then they actually um, uh, weren't so wise in communicating that they were progressing into clinical routine with the, and there were the, the protests from the other non transplant centers. You can't just go on with DCD. You have to ask us, we have to discuss if that was a good thing to do and so on. So we have this discussion now. And actually, we are seeing that the constant rates are going down a bit for the for uh, from the families. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've only five minutes. Yeah. So and and we have traditionally, especially in Norway, we have a very strict uh, definition of brain death and very strict requirements for for brain death diagnostics. 
I thought before I talked to you, I thought we were the only ones in the world requiring imaging of uh, no perfusion of the brain, but you have it as well, I learned. Uh, so before, um, before 2015, it was always uh, cerebral angiography that was mandatory. And after that, it was still imaging, but not it was, wasn't tagged to the angiography. Uh, before you can um, declare a, a person a, a potential donor or a donor. And this is just to compare the UK, American and, and Swedish um, rules for death diagnostics. Or um, So we had this imaging thing and that uh, led to a, a, a myth or a tradition in our pediatric intensive care units and neonatology intensive care units that it's not possible in, in children with an open fontanelle, with an open skull, to do this imaging. It will always be a perfusion, even if there's, there's, no, there's a little research done on it, but it's not zero. You will find uh, potential donors even with, a, with an open skull. But we actually, we don't have the tradition and not the logistics in our departments to identify potential donors. And we have calculated, we should have one or two in Norway, and so, equally like eight or 10 in the in Scandia transplant for the baby donors or infant donors. Mm -hmm. And we have to identify them. We have still work to do to be better, to get better in that. And I actually, yeah. So uh, another alternative would be the um, uh, radionuclide angiography or scintigraphy. Uh, that would could be an alternative way we haven't uh, explored it in, in our country, if it would be a way to, to go. So we have we are just building a, a working group to work on it, actually, to find infant donors in Norway. I'm supposed to, to pull that group together. And the first thing would be, what can we achieve with our current regulations in Norway? And the next thing for the years after, can we actually alter the regulations? Maybe I have to talk to you then, five years again. Okay, to sum up, the Nordic countries are uh, significantly sized within the HLT to be like to publish things and to be to be more visible with our activities. If we just cooperate, uh, there are both regulatory, institutional, and cultural obstacles to our cooperation and to our visibility. Uh, all our centers are dependent on subspecialty training abroad, like we do with ASLAC. And we are very grateful that he's, he's here and he's allowed to train here. And we have our own national challenges with our DEVAR program so far, um, with our brain death criteria, uh, but still our results are comparable to everybody else and we are, we are happy with that. So thank you for your attention. This was last week in Lillehammer, my wife skiing with me, mm -hmm. if you remember from the 94 yeah, Winter Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. yeah, very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. That was a great presentation. I'll just stop sharing. Um, if you have questions on your end, uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and just yeah. ask. Um, maybe we'll start with you. And then you can also put questions in the chat. I don't see any there yet. But otherwise, we can start from here. Anybody have questions? Okay. Simon, you bring Simon? Yeah. Okay, it doesn't sound like we have questions from the outside at this point. Do we have questions in the audience here? At least you know that Norway isn't the capital of Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cartoon. Yeah. Uh, so this is from Dr. Corey, and he asks, can you summarize how healthcare is delivered in Norway, private versus public, and the role of insurance companies? Well, <laughs> uh, 
That's a funny question with Norwegian eyes. So it's a, it says hospital is almost completely public and governmentally governmentally financed, even if our model of organizing it is new public management, more or less. But it's it's public. And uh, primary care is also to a large degree uh, public. And insurance companies are unknown in Norway. We have a, a governmental organization. Uh, when you get sick, when you need your meds, and things. It's very similar to Canada, actually, hospital-wise, but the meds are covered as well. Mm -hmm. Not the dentist, but the meds. I was curious about that as well. So, so two things. One is, if you look at your numbers, actually, if you would add the newborn transplants or the infant transplants, it would probably be very similar to everybody else. Because if you look at the worldwide data, we make about 50% like the first year, mm -hmm. make about 50% of all pediatric transplants, and they have excellent outcomes. So, so that's probably where the difference is. Um, you mentioned that you send your, your people to um, Australia and Canada and everywhere. Why not to Sweden if they would call baby transplants? They send their people to the same centers. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if you have had Karin Car Mike. If she's been here or in sick, I'm not sure. But she's she's exchanging with Jennifer. Okay. A lot. Okay. Okay. So we have the same network. <laughs> okay. So nobody nobody in Scandinavia no. trains each other. No. So okay. can I just ask you, Thomas, um, that that you mentioned the maybe historically the sort of reluctance to intervene in very young infants yeah. to uh, maybe they just help comfort care. But what mm. about surgical interventions in infants? non-transplant surgical interventions. Has that met with the same sort of philosophy? No, it's not, actually. And uh, I've tried to, to use that argument as well. If you look at the single ventricular survival, uh, including all of them from start, it's not it, for sure not better than uh, if you think about transplant. But it's not, it's not the same uh, reluctancy, no. Well, how do you, how, I have a hard time getting my head yeah. around that. How, it just seems so illogical. Help me, I, I don't understand it. You have been part of this discussion as well. I, I don't understand as well. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm struggling to, to get behind it, actually. I, I remember, and it's, oh, it's a long time ago now, maybe more than 20 years ago, being at a meeting in France, and there was the same, the same thing that, that, well, they're very reluctant to have a, I don't know, I think the term that the person used was less than perfect. Um, child and then therefore didn't want to think about infant transplants and yet the, I, mean, I just couldn't understand yeah. how the child who's born with single ventricle anatomy is any less perfect mm -hmm. going down the transplant pathway or down the yeah. surgical pathway or one to the other um, than I just find it a very oh. odd philosophy. Yeah, uh, I agree and I'm, I try to overcome it actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. interesting. That's really interesting. And it's maybe it's connected also. I don't know your prenatal diagnosis and termination rates and so on, because the, the ultrasound world the development of prenatal diagnosis is quite strong in the Nordic countries. And in Denmark, actually, they are, if you want to put it that way, the best, they are they are actually diagnosing almost all of the single ventricle cases and they're not born anymore. So uh -huh. they don't do any front chance anymore. Is that right? Almost at all. And our numbers are down to like three to five a year per five million. Yeah. So they're diagnosed, but still we have to do it right for those who are born. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the routine recommendation would be to abandon the pregnancy for a normal hypoplastic left heart? I don't think they want to call it a recommendation, but uh, they open up to terminate yeah. your pregnancy. And I think they they try to give you the, the picture like it is for the front yeah. end. Yeah. And culturally, culturally, the, the, the Scandinavian parents, most of them would choose to terminate. Yeah. But then we have like a strong, uh, a large group of uh, Polish East Eastern European immigrants. Mm -hmm. They would be more reluctant, or from or refugees from other countries. So so they have different names today, actually. Yeah, well, that's uh, very interesting. I think um, I don't know what the exact number is because the prenatal detection rate is extremely good here as well. Mm -hmm. But 
I would, I, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's not a general recommendation for a normal hypothesis mm -hmm. um, to discontinue the pregnancy. I would think more than 50% or so of them are probably being born. Even, even the very extreme abnormalities like heterotaxy with disbalance ABSBs mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. born, although they are been able to detect it. So it's probably a culturally uh, different thing. And there's a discre discrepancy, right? Because in the in the northern Europe countries, you would assume you have the best assistance or 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 network or, or organization around the child with special yeah. needs. Yeah. And still probably the termination rates would be the highest. But it is part of the recommendation, not recommendations, it's part of the counseling as the options for the families, right? Yeah. I a hundred percent the I think it's how counseling is done. So I bet you there's just strategic differences in how counseling are done or how it's presented to the families in terms of uh, you know, maybe implicit biases that you're not really, you know, aware that you're giving off to families, but it is part of the counseling here, but it's just as Simon said. <clears throat> the, the rate of termination is lower than in other parts of the world. And the cultural background thing is the same here, right? Like very Catholic or Muslim countries just don't consider it as an option, no matter in the end what, what mm -hmm. findings will be. Mm -hmm. okay, do we have any other questions uh, from the people online? Dr. Hedron didn't want to weigh into the cyclosporine discussion. <laughs> Or... I think there's a chat question from Ben Simon. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Sivarajan is uh, the head of the pediatric cardiac ICU. I don't know if you had a chance to meet him, and he's also quite active with DCD. Yeah. Have, do you want to reread the question? Can you talk about re regionalization of congenital heart care in Norway? You are the congenital heart center in Oslo, but our patients managed with congenital heart disease, heart failure, late post transplant in regional centers to a certain level, or do they all get managed centrally in Oslo? No, we have a decentralized uh, care. So we don't have pediatric subspecialties. We are all pediatricians with special interests, but we, we are not formally subspecialized with an exam or so. And we don't have the power or the numbers to educate everybody doing pediatric cardiology with care and care. Uh, Electrophysiology or so. So we are more, we are less broad than than you are here when you are a fully trained pediatric cardiologist. But we have people doing follow up at the twenty centers in Norway as well, in close cooperation with us. So we are doing shared follow up, and all the pediatricians doing the cardiology in other centers. They are, they train. They are for some periods in in Oslo as well, visit us and training with us, and we have regular meetings and. And so on. So yes, we are decentralized, but we are very close together in the network as well. So your transplant patients coming back to you, all of them? Yes, at every least, year, uh, every year, once a year, at least every year. Yeah. And do you have? Do you use a lot of video conferencing as well, or is that also more and more? Thanks to the privacy. pandemic, Thanks to we are doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, because you've seen us kind of, and that's that's a bit of the difference if you compare Alberta alone. Yes, it's only four million people, yeah. but our catchment area really is from. Saskatchewan, Manitoba, hmm. uh, North and South Alberta, and BC. So we end up with about 15 million people and accordingly about probably three to four times yeah. Your, yeah. your case number. And actually we are thinking about, we haven't got started really, but we are thinking about to do more video uh, consultations with families as well. So they don't need to travel to also. It's, a, it's not as long as here, but still a two hour flight also and all. Yeah just for an echo or so and the kid is well, yeah or a cancer cat if the kid has cold or something so we want to do it more more home-based or less traveling and less intensive okay any other questions just a comment i don't want you leaving thinking that we don't control information because for connect care you can only access since you're directly working with and emailing out patients, you have to use AHS with the email, which is encrypted. And if you send it anywhere else, it has to be encrypted before mm -hmm. you send it out. And we do find people who, yeah. who are yeah. going in the wrong thing. So yeah, we're not quite uh, no. as open as it may sound. 
Does it actually help? That was what I was wondering. So if you have, as you may have heard, SickKids recently was completely blocked for two days by ransomware. So do these things not happen in the more restrictive Scandinavian countries? Or are people still opening stupid attachments? Yeah. And yes, they do. <laughs> okay. It does just take longer time to get there, but you still open it and then it happens. Okay. You get tested, too. they send it out to you and then go, you fool, you weren't supposed to open that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, 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 learn some more. But... Stay okay. So that's the most interesting part about it is actually that apparently the ransom askers, when they noticed it was a children's hospital, they abandoned their plan and gave it free again. But they were for like a week or so, it was all their research infrastructure was down. Yeah. At least that's what they say that they didn't say. Yeah. I thought that may be our downtime for Connect Care if we get something. Okay, I guess then we'll wrap it up. I see no more questions um, from the online audience. Uh, next um, thank you for attending today, and feel free to send any further questions to us, and we can always pass them on to Thomas if they come up later. Thank you. Thanks.